This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I am Amy Goodman in New York. Juan Gonzalez is with us from New Jersey. And we're spending the rest of the hour with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author Isabel Wilkerson, whose new book actually grows out of her widely acclaimed book, The Warmth of Other Suns, which tells the history of the Great Migration and waves of African Americans moved out of the South to escape racism, only to face it again in the North. Well, in her new book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, Wilkerson argues that, based on her extensive research, America's racial hierarchy should be thought of as a caste system, similar to what she calls the world's most recognized caste system in India. She also looks at how Nazi Germany borrowed from Jim Crow laws of the United States. They were not Hitler's model. Wilkerson writes, quote, "...searching the histories of all three hierarchies and poring over a wealth of studies on caste across many disciplines, I began to compile the parallels in a more systematic way and identified the essential shared characteristics of these hierarchies, what I call the eight pillars of caste, traits disturbingly present in all of them." Isabel Wilkerson, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. But I want to start um, by asking you about what just happened here in this country. You know, you write in your book about Dr. Martin Luther King's month-long visit to India, when he visited with high school students whose families had been so-called untouchables, and how he was then called one. And that relates directly to to Joe Biden's choice as his vice presidential candidate, his running mate, Senator Kamala Harris. She becomes now the first woman of color to be nominated for national office by a major political party. Uh, she is the daughter of immigrants. Um, she is African American, her father from Jamaica, and her mother from India. So she's the first Indian American to be nominated as well as African American. If you can comment on the significance of this. Well, the significance of this is that so many long stocks have been overcome or have been crossed moment uh, to have someone who is the first woman of color, the first woman of, of African descent, the first woman of Indian descent to be uh, nominated for uh, a, a, a a major party phenomenal uh, moment. And to think about how many barriers had to be crossed, this is it's taken 244 years to get to this day. Um, we're going to go right now um, to the visit that you write about in CAST, that visit that Martin Luther King made to the state of Kerala in India. He was there in India for a month. He visited with high school students whose families had been untouchables. Well, in a speech to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council in February of 1965, Dr. King describes his visit and the introduction that was given of him by the principal. As he came to the end of his introduction, he said, I would like to present to you a fellow untouchable from the United States of America. And for the moment, I was peeved, I was shocked that I would be introduced as an untouchable. But pretty soon, my mind ran back across to America. And I started thinking about the fact that there were so many places that I couldn't go because of the color of my skin, I started thinking about the fact that my 20 million brothers and sisters in the Negro community of America are still at the bottom of the economic ladder, deprived of adequate housing conditions, unable to live in numerous neighborhoods because of the color of their skin. I started thinking about the fact that my little children were still judged on the basis of the color of their skin rather than the content of their character. And I had to say to myself, I am an untouchable. 
And every Negro in the United States is an untouchable. That is Dr. Martin Luther King speaking in 1965 about his 1959 visit to India. Isabel Wilkerson, you write magnificently about this journey and um, how you came to look at this country, um, like others look at India, talking about the centrality of caste. Tell us more about Dr. King's visit to India. Well, he had arrived uh, in 1959, obviously inspired by the country and by uh, the, the leadership of Mohandas K. Gandhi, who had uh, inspired uh, his nonviolent uh, approach to freeing African Americans from the grip of what he ultimately would uh, identify as a caste system in his own country, in, in the United States. And so he arrived uh, to uh, visit the school, and as we so eloquently heard his reciting, uh, recalling that experience, it, at first, when he was identified or he was uh, introduced to the children, to the students there, uh, as an untouchable, the, the word landed a little oddly for him because he hadn't thought of himself in that way. And as he considered and scrolled back into his memories of, of and, and experiences and recognition of all of the things that had been uh, restricted for, by both for both him and uh, and the 20 million other uh, African Americans that he was fighting for. He himself, Dr. King, recognized that um, America had beneath its, its infrastructure a caste system uh, that was not as different from India as we might like to believe. And uh, Isabel Wil Wilkerson, first of all, I want to congratulate you on such a marvelously written book, just as your first, uh, your earlier book was so marvelously written. And I wanted to ask you about a particular uh, uh, section of it where you write, caste is the bone, race is the skin, caste is fixed and rigid, race is fluid and superficial, subject to periodic redefinition to meet the needs of the dominant caste in what is now the United States. If you could expound for those of our readers who, uh, of our viewers who haven't read your book yet, this yeah. <laughs> uh, relationship that you try to delve into between caste and race. Well, first I want to say that I came to the to the concept of race through the first book that I wrote, uh, The Warmth of the Sons, in which I was writing about the uh, the flight of, of six million African Americans who were uh, escaping the Jim Crow South. And in writing about what they had endured, writing about what the Jim Crow South was actually like, a lot of Americans uh, have not really gotten that true exposure to what it was like to live in that world where everything that you could do or could not do was based upon what you looked like, that it was actually against the law for a black person and a white person to play checkers together. So I was recreating that world. And in, and, and recreating that world, I did not use the word racism because it did not seem sufficient to capture the totality of the and the comprehensive nature of the control restrictions and boundaries. So I came to the So that calls upon us to think about, well, what does caste mean? What is caste? So caste system essentially is an arbitrary uh, grading, an artificial grading, graded ranking of, of human value in a society. And it's one in which uh, there's a, a, a fixed uh, infrastructure that in our country predates anyone who's alive today. It goes all the way back to uh, colonial times when the when the country was being formed. And a caste system essentially deter determines one's standing, the respect accorded a person, the benefit of the doubt, uh, access to resources, or the deprivation of, the, of access to those resources, even such things as assumptions of competence and beauty. So these are the, this is the hierarchy that we have all inherited, that no one alive created, but we have inherited it, and we live under the shadow of that, uh, of that system. You also write about what you call the middle caste of Asians, Latinos, indigenous people, and new immigrants from, of African descent, who you say navigate within what began as a bipolar hierarchy. I'm, I'm wondering if you could explain that and also why you chose to include indigenous people uh, uh, in the middle caste when some would argue that Certainly in the United States and certainly in Latin America, there has been a long existing caste system toward the native peoples, whether it's in Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, Mexico, and, uh, and of course in the United States. So why you felt that the indigenous people should be included among this middle caste? 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, the the caste system, uh, as I'm describing it, uh, we have to go back to where it began. It began with the the creation of the country, which in which uh, the people who were the colonists, who were British, uh, placed themselves uh, obviously at the top of the hierarchy, and then imported, brought people in from from Africa uh, to be the enslaved people, who would automatically, by definition, be at the very bottom of the caste system, having no rights whatsoever, not even rights over their own bodies. And so there also were, of course, the indigenous people who were the the, the, the first nations of this of this land, who then were in some ways uh, ex exiled from the caste system that was being created as, as in a bipolar caste system. So in many ways, respects, and I also say that they are uh, in some ways outside, forced to be outside of the caste system in the ways that the colonists devised it by forcing them off of their land. The bipolar caste system uh, is meant that there were basically two main groups that were the uh, the foundation uh, as the, that the country created, and then anyone entering this bipolar uh, caste system then had to figure out where did they fit in, had to somehow navigate what had been created as as a two-tiered system, and uh, the the uh, the infrastructure that had been created had to also decide, you know, ask, actually. Uh, assigned people to roles on the basis primarily of what they look like and what their uh, lineage might have been, what part of the world they come from. So uh, when people were arriving, say, from, from Europe, they were not, uh, from outside of, of, of uh, Northern Europe, they were not necessarily thinking of themselves as white. They, the white was not um, a label that had been applied uh, or needed to be applied, I should say, to someone who was living in 16th century uh, of what would now be uh, Ireland or uh, Hungary or Poland. In other words, people who were arriving to the United States in the early decades and, and even century of, the, of, of history uh, in the United States were not arriving as white people in their minds. They were arriving as Irish or Polish or Hungarian. Upon arrival, though, they were assigned to the category, essentially a new category. The idea of race is a fairly new one, going back only about 500 years, race as we currently know it. So they had to then navigate and readjust their identi identity in order to, mit to meet the expectations of this caste system that they were entering. And so did other people who were coming from other parts of the world. The United States uh, in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century went to a great deal of trouble to curate its population, particularly those who uh, were not coming from Northern Europe. And so anyone coming from outside of Northern Europe then had to be fit into this caste system. And that meant that there was a tremendous amount of, of uh, of uh, uh, dis, uh, dissolution and a tremendous amount of, of restlessness about trying to figure out who would fit. So there was uh, there were a lot of legal challenges uh, of people coming from from Asia, people coming from other parts of the world to petition for the for the recognition of citizenship, petition ultimately for the recognition of being able to fit into what was the category of the dominant caste which would have been uh, white or Caucasian at that time. And so this is uh, a work in progress, has always been a work in progress. And so anyone coming in from outside of what the po these polls that were arbitrary, random designations of human beings, ended up having to find a way to navigate. And it created, um, it created this uh, stressor, these stressors and tensions between groups as they tried to, to figure out how to survive in a, an often forbidding uh, bipolar structure. And you bring in Nazi Germany, Isabel Wilkerson. If you can explain um, how it was the United States and the Jim Crow laws that inspired the Nazis, explain how that all fits together with caste. Well, I have to say that uh, I my main focus in the beginning was to look for the parallels or the intersections, the point of intersections that would help us understand our own country, it's primarily focused on the United States, but to help us understand our own country uh, through through what we might learn from how other countries have managed their hierarchies. And I, uh, what brought me to Germany was actually Charlottesville, and that was there in the protests uh, of against the potential removal of the statue of Robert E. Lee. That the that the ralliers themselves uh, displayed the symbols uh, of 
uh, the Confederacy and the Nazi uh, Party, the, uh, the Nazis, in this one space. We saw the pageantry of the, the symbols coming together over the uh, issues of, of memory of the Civil War, memory of slavery, memory of American history in general. And so the ralliers there are the ones that put these two together, uh, these two symbols together, these two cultures together. And that was the reason why I decided to look more closely at Germany. I was looking primarily to find out how had they managed uh, to uh, understand, uh, re-educate uh, themselves and the society, atone for what had happened during World War II. How had they remembered what had happened? And so the deeper I looked, it turned out that I discovered things that I never would have imagined. Uh, one of them had having to do with the fact that, uh, that uh, German, uh, German eugenicists were in uh, contact with in continuing dialogue with American eugenicists in the years and decades leading up to uh, the, the Third Reich, that uh, American eugenicists wrote books that were big sellers in Germany in the years leading up to the Third Reich. Now, the, the Nazis needed no one to teach them how to hate. They absolutely needed no inspiration for how to hate or how to enact that hate. But what they did was they, they sent researchers to the United States to study the Jim Crow laws uh, here in the United States to study and to research how the United States had managed to uh, subordinate and sub subjugate its, its African-American population. They sent people to research the miscegenation, anti-miscegenation laws. Uh, they sent them to understand and to, to, to study uh, the segregation laws. And then they went back and they debated the American laws uh, to in the in the run up to uh, creating what would ultimately become the Nuremberg laws. These were just stunning and wrenching things to discover in the process of this work. We only have 30 seconds left, Isabel Wilkerson, but you relate the story of talking to Gwen Ifill at a party, being deeply concerned—this is before the presidency of Donald Trump—that he would win. And you cited 2042. Why? I, I mentioned 2042 because that is the year that was projected uh, uh, in, 20, in 2008 by the census as to be the year that uh, the demographics of the United States would change to a configuration that no one in the country of any uh, in any space had ever imagined, and that would be where the uh, historic white majority would no longer be the majority, and that, in fact, uh, the, the configuration that we've known for all of American history would be changing. And that has an impact on everyone uh, in the hierarchy, everyone in the country, everyone in society, to try to figure out how do we work toward uh, a space in which everyone can feel uh, feel seen and feel uh, that they are recognized as citizens in this country. Well, Isabel Wilkerson, we're going to do part two of this interview of this incredible book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. Isabel Wilkerson, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and winner of the National Humanities Medal. Part two, coming up at democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe. Wear a mask.